Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Herring, and um, today I'm here to talk to you about revolutionizing architecture or how technology is changing the way we design. So thank you for coming. So why don't we start with the objectives of this presentation. So by the end of the talk, I want to show how architecture and technology have been connected throughout history. <clears throat> the tools used in designing buildings and structures, and what the future holds for architecture, <clears throat> design, and the spaces we live in. So first of all, a quick introduction to myself. I'm from London in the UK, and I studied architecture, hence my interest in this subject. Um, and I came to Japan in 2013, and I did uh, some work as a teacher in tech recruiting, and now I've pivoted to, uh, into becoming a full stack engineer. So without much further ado, um, so first of all, maybe we should just define what is architecture. So we could say it's the process and the product of planning, designing, and constructing buildings or other structures. And what is technology? So it could be the sum of techniques, skills, methods, and processes used in the production of goods or services or in the accomplishment of objectives. So a bit wordy, and maybe throughout this presentation, I can give you some examples. And why is architecture important? So this is, this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, culture, you know, it's a reflection of who we are as a society. Um, quality of life, you know, good architecture makes our lives and communities better. And progress, you know, it shows what we can achieve if we put our minds to it as humans. So, um, First of all, though, let's have a very brief history of architecture and technology. I'm going to go quite far back. So let's start in ancient times, where some say architects in, in ancient Egypt were treated second only uh, to the pharaohs and gods. So they were pretty important. And um, they obviously they developed the pyramids and they uh, maybe they used some of the earliest algorithms, such as pre-Pythagorean geometry. And then, of course, we have the Greeks, who were so in love with mathematics and, and logic that they built their or they they built their temples around it, such as the Golden Ratio. And then, slightly less ancient, we have the uh, cathedrals of of ancient oh sorry of Europe, um, and these were built by master craftsmen, who would um, often keep their knowledge and see and and experience a secret and would only pass it on to those in their family. So we actually don't have that much written information of how they built these amazing structures that, as I think you can see in the picture, really pushed material to its limits. And of course, places such as the Middle East, who um, built some fantastic structures with domes that took many centuries before um, places such as Europe uh, rediscovered how to, how to build again. And then we can move on to modernism. And um, you know, the birth of, um, of our house and in the early 20th century and uh, the emphasis on clean lines, structural purity and the use of the latest technology, of course. And then perhaps a more contemporary period, we can, uh, we can finally see where architecture and technology have blended seamlessly to create, some would say, a kind of geometric craziness or wonder, you know, I love it, binocular buildings, anyone, um, but seriously, you know, modern architecture um, is completely beholden to technology um, and couldn't work without it. So how do we design buildings? Um, this is a, you know, a very um, uh, important question. So, you know, the tools are, are, are maybe the most vital part of this. So once upon a time, we would have used pen, paper, some patience, maybe a protractor and a compass, and we would have sat in a, in a, big, in a big hall uh, behind drawing boards. But now we can do all of this on software. We can use 3D modeling software, VR, um, scripting languages. So, okay, uh, let's take a breather. So a case study, you are an architect. I want you to imagine that you have been asked by a client to design the perfect house. How are you going to do this? So you have a brief. It should be set in the countryside. Um, it's 230 meters squared. And the budget is $1 million. Okay, not too bad. Maybe you consult with some engineers, with some engineers and surveyors, 
and you draw some plans up and they look fantastic and you go back to your clients and it is set in the countryside it is the perfect size but oh no it will cost three million dollars you realize how can this have happened you're a, you're an experienced architect um you're one of the best why does this happen well unfortunately you're human and you're prone to error so is there something we can do about this well enter parametric design so um parametric design um let's break it down is a um it's a, let's break it down into into its structure so parameter is anything that informs and or constrains the design decision so weather and location you know is it is it a hot climate does it have a lot of rain um the budget what is the optimized design for the amount to be spent the materials you know how far can steel timber or stone be stretched materially and design what is design well it's it's a blueprint to turn an idea into action and so parametric design we could say is to translate an idea through parameters into action but enough talking let's have a small demonstration so in this demonstration i'm about to give i'm going to show um some 3d uh, modeling software specifically called rhino 3d it's a cad computer aided design and also grasshopper 3d which is a visual programming language and is a, is a plugin for rhino and if you're wondering what a visual programming language is, well, I'll show you in a second, but a brief description is it's a program that lets users um, create programs by manipulating elements graphically. So maybe you might not have seen something like this before, but let's have a look. So I'm going to go to our demonstration. So as you can see here on the left, we are in something called Rhino, which is the software. And we can we have a building here. We have a pre-built building. Look at that. That's lucky, isn't it? And we can maneuver around this structure to have a look at it. And if we even wanted to, we could we could build a, another one right here to accompany it. But maybe that's for another day. So that's great, and we can model really effectively in Rhino. But let's take a look at the right now, at the right right window, and you can see this kind of tangle of wires and and blocks and so what is this well this is grasshopper this is the 3d uh, sorry this is the visual programming language and this directly relates to this structure on the left in fact it is the structure on the left and this is how we can build these structures um, and if i zoom in here you can see that we have some what look like inputs or parameters so we can affect we can change the way the building looks by sliding these back and forth and maybe if I went to something else over here, for example, <clears throat> again, we can change the we can change the design very simply and effectively. But only really would we be able to do this with software such as this. So it's very unique and very useful. So that's a very brief <laughs> example of, um, of how we can use parametric design, design buildings. So what does this actually look like though in practice? Well. I mean, as you can see here, this is a this is a classic example of parametric design, and to me, it looks incredible. Um, it makes you question how how humans can can build such a thing. It looks like it defies gravity, um, and it you know it is it is a really good point. Maybe have we reached the pinnacle of what we can do um, as humans in in terms of designing structures like this? So, what comes next? What comes next? Well. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, how do you think architects spend most of their time? Do they spend it designing those wonderful structures? Well, no, actually, uh, they spend most of their time designing tower blocks or buildings such as this. <laughs> so how many of these blocks exist on the planet? Well, let's just say a lot, probably hundreds of millions. Um, so what if we could use technology to improve this, to improve the life of an architect? Um, well, uh, maybe we can. So that's what I want to discuss now. So the rise of artificial intelligence in architecture. Um, so before we start, though, we should probably clear up what exactly is artificial intelligence. Well, I suppose it can have a variety of uh, maybe different meanings, but maybe a key concept is AI is a broad term suggesting intelligence demonstrated by machines. Uh, it could be a simulation 
of human intelligence and machines. So programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. And challenging and competing with traditional technology and ways of working. This is a big, big point now. And it can be broken down into subcategories. So, okay, let's have a look. Some AI categories, right. So this diagram, I think you can see, we have machine learning as a subcategory, neural networks, expert systems, robotics, NLP, fuzzy logic. You could probably spend a lifetime studying those individual subjects there. But I want to look at machine learning and specifically deep learning. Um, and within that, um, something called uh, Generative Adversarial Neural Network, or GAN. So what is, what is GAN? What is GAN? Let's, let's, let's. So it's a machine learning framework used to train a model or algorithm to replicate data. And it makes two sets of data compete with each other, one real, the other generated or fake. And the goal is to output data as realistic as possible to humans. Okay, again, a bit wordy. Why don't we have a little sketch to show this? So why don't we start? We have something called a generator and a discriminator. And it's the generator's job on the left to create data, to try and trick the discriminator into thinking that it's real, that the data is real. And so talking about data, we need some, right? So why don't we have a random input data at the bottom? And then the picture on the top is an unknown um, it's an unknown image. We don't know whether it's real or it's, or it's been generated. So we're going to feed this, um, these images into the discriminator. And the discriminator needs to decide, is it real or, is it, or has it been generated? Is it fake? And unfortunately, well, or lucky, luckily, um, the discriminator has chosen correctly. This is, in fact, real data. It's from our data set. OK, so the generator. Um, has not been involved in this step. But now, oh, right. <clears throat> but now, um, for the next step, we want the generator to do something. So we, again, we're going to have our input data. And this input data is also going to be fed into a generator. And the generator is going to create what it thinks is a, as good an image as it possibly can make to trick the discriminator. And again, this is going to be fed into the discriminator. And it's going to choose if it's real or fake. And up, the discriminator is too good. It knows that the generated image is fake. OK, unlucky generator. However, um, the generator is going to receive feedback from this. And it's going to work to improve. And it's, it's going to, the next time it generates an image, it's, it's going to try and make it a, a, that bit better, which is great, right? However, unfortunately, the discriminator is also um, also knows what the generator is up to. So it's going to work a bit harder as well to detect fake images. And so this is a, it's a kind of loop. And um, the, the end goal um, ultimately is for generated data to become as uh, realistic as possible or as close as possible to target data. Maybe not exactly the same, but enough that we as humans can't really tell the difference. OK, so that's GAN. So how does this really relate to architecture? Well, if you remember, I told you a few slides that a lot of architects spend their time designing pretty standard looking buildings. And these buildings um, generally are, are drawn from floor plans. And these floor plans tend to look the same, don't they? They have the same, um, they have the same kind of rooms. They have the same functionality. So maybe we can do something to speed this process up. And that is exactly what GAN or AI and GAN can do. So we can speed up the design process, maybe from months, days, or even hours. So, and it obviously it can reduce costs and increases efficiency as well. So let's have another case study. We have got, um, an, we want to create an AI apartment. Ooh, wow, using GAN. So we're gonna have some parameters or inputs we've got uh, location, size, um, and the weather, for example, all, all inputs that might go into designing a building. And we want to create, we want to throw this into an algorithm, and out, pop, and out pops the perfect apartment block, perfectly created to meet our needs. So 
hmm, how are we going to do this? You know, are there any precedents for this? Well, luckily, um, uh, an architect and data scientist um, from Harvard called Stanislas Chaliu um, has developed an algorithm that can do just this. And it uses a machine learning framework called TensorFlow and the GAN model, uh, specifically picks to picks um, And the idea is to create an AI apartment block so first of all, we need our floor plan of which we maybe have a huge data set. We want to create a building layout. And of course, we want our, our building to have rooms within each apartment. And within those rooms, we want furniture laid out in the perfect position, exactly where furniture should be laid out if they were to be placed there by a human. So step one, we're gonna build a footprint model and we're gonna use a GAN to do this. So if you remember, again, it takes a floor plan input and it generates a floor plan output. And this output is compared to real data. Does it look realistic? You know, I think so. I, I think it, it could pass. Um, and repeat this process for all floor plans in, data set, in a data set. So you're building up, you're training your model. Now repeat step one, but with additional parameters. So of course we want windows, we want corridors, we want room divisions. So we're gonna repeat this process, training our model until it gets more and more accurate. Now we want some finishing touches. So beds, tables, cupboards, you know, we want, we want all of this to be positioned um, exactly where they should be. So final step, you're ready to move in. So we're gonna chain these models together to create an apartment block. Aha, brilliant. So a little bit extra as well with maybe um, a nice additional feature. If you're going to create an AI algorithm, why not? You can decide where you want the rooms to be. So as a, as a, as a client or customer, you can choose where uh, windows, where doors will be located with a click and a drag of a mouse. So. This is fantastic. Sounds great, doesn't it? Um, but, you know, where does this leave the role of the poor architect? Um, <laughs> so, you know, will AI replace the role of architects, designers, and even builders? And will we live in houses, building cities, countries even, designed by AI? And will AI take the creativity out of our lives? You know, that, that's part of the joy maybe of doing something like architecture is it's creative. So these are all big questions that may be being asked now. But, you know, that's one point of view. Then there's another point of view, of course, you know, will, will AI free up architects and designers just like parametric design did um, many years ago? And will there be more time to focus on the customer and better overall design? And maybe there will be more time to be creative. No more block buildings. Um, now you can design more interesting things or work on more interesting product, products, sorry, projects. And of course, you know, um, as humans and, and I'm sure designers as well, we've, we've always tried to imagine what the future might look like. Sometimes it turns out kind of similar. Other times it's just fantastical. So the, the, the future always holds a, a mix of technology and our current ways of doing things. And of course, if that doesn't work out, we can all move into the virtual world and uh, move, move into Decentraland, where, um, where parameters mean nothing, gravity makes no sense. We can party and dance all night and spend our uh, cryptocurrency as freely as we wish using blockchain. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. My name is Mark Herring. And you can find me on GitHub at World on a Wire. And I've also included, included some research links just below. Okay, thank you for listening.